Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. In just a little while, penetrating the fog around a mysterious State Department funded refuge for neoconservatives, the foundation for the future. But first, protecting our kitchens, eggs contaminated by salmonella, beef by a dangerous strain of E. coli, peanuts, spinach, you name it. The food industry is reeling from contamination scandals. So are the federal agencies responsible for ensuring food safety getting the job done? The Union of Concerned Scientists posed just that question and many more to the food safety professionals at the FDA and USDA. And with us to discuss the results is Francesca Griffo, Scientific Integrity Director at UCS. Welcome, Francesca, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys are not new to conducting surveys of federal agencies, are you? No, we've now surveyed about nine different agencies. We've done climate scientists, we've done the Environmental Protection Agency, and we've actually done the Food and Drug Administration before. Okay, so tell me about what you were attempting to get at with this survey. Well, we knew from the same news accounts that you've discussed that there are obviously things that are wrong with our food safety system. But as usual, the voices from inside the agencies weren't actively part of the debate. And by that I mean not the folks at the top, but the actual rank and file, the folks that are actually inspecting the food, the scientists that are actually working on these issues. So what these surveys do is give us a way of really including them in the conversation. So we picked out a list of 8,000 scientists and food inspectors, which is actually the hardest part of doing the survey, is identifying those folks. We had um, a really good collaboration with uh, Iowa State University, their Center for Survey Statistics, mm -hmm. and working with them, put together a survey instrument and sent it out. And so you sent it out to uh, thousands of people. About 8,000. Uh, at FDA and USDA. Mm -hmm. How many results did you get? We had uh, over a thousand folks come back, um, mm -hmm. actually uh, d differs from question to question, mm -hmm. different amounts of, of responses, mm -hmm. but we had about a 21.6 response rate, which is quite good for a survey like this. And how does that compare to your past surveys? A little bit higher. Ah, interesting. And so I have to ask you about possible bias in mm -hmm. the survey because mm -hmm. the Union Concerned Scientists does have a public profile mm -hmm. in the scientific community. You have a reputation. People know you're out there on certain issues. Would that not affect who would be interested in responding to your survey? Well, you know, we try very hard to minimize that effect. Um, by working with Iowa State University, we actually don't have the data. They collect the data, they process it, and they send it to us, so we can't mess with it that way. We try to have scientific integrity of our own. Um, but I think what's really important is that Iowa worked with us on the phrasing of the questions. And then in looking at the results, um, there is an open-ended essay question at the end. And when you look at those responses in those essay questions, which are all on our website, you don't see that we had responses from angry, cantankerous people. In fact, the responses come back, and you can hear it in their words in these essays, from scientists who care, from inspectors who are worried about the system. On the other hand, we had some very positive results. We had a very large number of folks come back to us and say, we do think about public health. Public health really matters. So if we had just captured the embittered, you know, I don't think we would have gotten those kind of responses. Okay, so let's talk about the specifics. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the most important findings in the survey. Well, I think the top line findings are that we didn't just find political interference, but we found political interference and corporate interference. And I think, interestingly, interference by Congress and interference by, you know, other nonprofits. So everybody's got an act in this game. Everybody wants to influence it. And it's very hard for the folks at the agencies to push back against that influence. Okay, so what does interference mean in this context? It means lots of things. Um, but I think in terms of Congress, for example, we had instances where members of Congress who had large food facilities, processing facilities in their districts would go to the top levels of FDA and say, hey, back off. You know, we don't want these inspections turning this stuff up. We don't want this particular uh, company being closed down. And the connections, you know, are, are obvious. I mean, these large companies are, you know, making donations to campaigns and then going to their uh, decision makers and saying, help, you know, we're being regulated. Well, of course they're being regulated. That's how you and I have safe food. It, was that an anomalous finding or was there a significant number of instances where uh, uh, employees at FDA or USDA said that there was interference of that kind. There were hundreds who reported that. 
And this would be interference <coughs> by Congress, interference by Interference by Congress. There were hundreds alone that reported that interference by Congress. But um, isn't that in some ways appropriate? Isn't that what Congress is there for, to look out for constituents? Congress is there to open up an investigation, to ask questions. Congress is not there to ask the agency to put the science aside and not make the best decision that is the most protective decision of the American public. Okay, but what about business interference? What did that, how did that uh, play out? Well, I think there were instances, you know, where people reported that they were asked um, by the, you know, upper levels of FDA who were having off-the-record conversations with these businesses um, and USDA um, to, you know, withhold certain data, to not use all the information, particularly when approving a product for sale. Um, and that's a problem. Obviously, we want all the information to be there. We want uh, scientists, inspectors, all of these folks to feel like if they see a problem, that they have a place to go with those issues and really talk about them. Mm -hmm. You also did a little bit of looking at the impact of the so-called revolving door, people going from industry to government, government to industry. What did you find there? You know, that's a hard one. Um, we found some instances of where a lot of people are freely moving back and forth between the food safety industries and the government agencies that regulate them. Now on its face that sounds like a terrible thing, but I'm not sure it's always terrible. I think it's just something that has to be disclosed completely so that we know which employees are do, doing that and we can sort of look at that in the context of their job performance. But I think you don't want to completely cut off that kind of flow of expertise because clearly people develop an incredible expertise in the agencies that's useful in industry and they develop, I think more importantly, an incredible expertise um, in the industry that's very useful for the agency when it's regulating. But it is certainly something that needs to be watched carefully. Uh, speaking of watching, you took a look at uh, whether employees at FDA, USDA thought that stronger whistleblower protections uh, might result in stronger food safety. And what did you find on that score? Very strong support for more whistleblower protections. I mean, you hate to be in the situation where you depend on that. We'd love to have a system where the system worked, because obviously blowing the whistle is a terribly traumatic event for anybody that does it. But in this case, what we did find was that, you know, there, there were many, many workers who really wanted to have those protections, because clearly they were seeing things that they wanted to talk about. Uh, Tell me about some of those. You profiled some of the whistleblowers in your report. Tell me about some of those. Well, there were a number of them. I mean, in a, in a general sense, without talking about specifics, um, I think these were people who were in the food industry, on the line, watching what was going on, and had deep, deep concerns about it. Things like um, practices that were not protective of public health. For example, um, instances where there were large vats used to cleanse carcasses and those vats were contaminated and the water was contaminated so even if you have clean carcasses the fecal matter ends up contaminating the whole batch. I mean that's a huge problem and we were very fortunate to have uh, people come forward um, to the Government Accountability Project to really reveal those stories which were very useful to us, especially useful because we understood those stories when we were putting the survey together and it was really helpful to know what we were trying to understand. Okay, so tell me about some of the take-home messages of the survey to you. Well, I think the take-home message is uh, a number of things. I mean, Congress is obviously working hard to try and get something done legislatively, but I think when we go take a step back and really look at the political interference You're talking about issues, the food modernization act. I am, I am. And you say that they're working hard to get this done. I think some people would argue maybe that they're not working quite hard enough because it hasn't gotten <laughs> done. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think there are things in that piece of legislation that will give the Food and Drug Administration more resources, more authority, you know, very important pieces of this so that they can and actually step And those whistleblower in. protections. And those whistleblower protections, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And of course those whistleblower protections we're working to try and get on a number of fronts. It's a challenge, it's a huge challenge. Um, but I think in addition to those specific things in that Food Safety Modernization Act, there are broader issues about political interference. I mean, when you have two different agencies, and we looked at USDA and the Food and Drug Administration, both reporting very similar results, you have to understand that this is a systemic problem, that this is something that's happening across multiple agencies, multiple arenas, and until we are able to really have these broad agency practices that not just happen, but that are actually become part of the agency fabric and part of the agency culture, you know, this is going to be an ongoing challenge and one that we need to watch. And so how do we get that? 
Well, right now we are trying and waiting very patiently for uh, the March 2009 memo that President Obama uh, put out on scientific integrity, which had fabulous principles in it for what should happen to actually be implemented in the agencies. This was one of the first things he did after he took office, wasn't it? Yep. He was inaugurated in January of 2009, and this was the beginning of March 2009. So very quickly, very important. So you, you've been monitoring this. What mm -hmm. is taking so long to get from there to here? Well, I think it's hard. I mean, it's really difficult. Um, anybody who's worked in a federal agency knows what a morass of bureaucracy that is. So I think that's one piece of it. But I think it's been just held up because this administration has been very busy with lots of things. Um, and I think it's it's a kind of revolutionary. I think people are very afraid of it. They're worried about, oh my God, what will happen if we actually give scientists the ability to, to freely talk to the press? You know, what will happen if we allow publications that aren't official government publications? What will happen if we open up the doors and really bring in this kind of transparency that, you know, we all want to see? It's scary. I mean, it's very scary, and it certainly means a loss of control. So I think it takes a while for them to figure this out. Um, we are hoping that we will see that executive order very soon because the hard thing is, you know, the executive order is not the end. The hard part is really going to be taking that executive order and figuring out how the agencies implement it and how we get those cultural changes that will be harder for the next administration to reverse. Well, many thanks to Francesca Griffo of the Union of Concerned Scientists for sharing your survey results with us and hopefully change we can believe in is on the way for our troubled food system. When we return, just what is the secretive foundation for the future? Does the name Paul Wolfowitz ring a bell? And why are taxpayers financing this foundation? Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. It's called the Foundation for the Future. It's funded by the State Department, but what exactly is it? And why is it so blinking hard to get information about this taxpayer-financed entity? With me to discuss this mysterious foundation is Shelley Walden, International Program Associate at the Government Accountability Project, and Patrice McDermott, Director of OpenTheGovernment.org. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank Hi. you. Shelley, let's start with you. So sure. what is the Foundation for the Future? Well, the Foundation for the Future was established to promote democracy and reform in the broader Middle East and Northern Africa region. That's like the clinical, technical definition. Um, but after researching it, I think what it really was was a public relations campaign by the Bush administration to retroactively justify the Iraq war. And the reason I say that is because after we invaded Iraq, there were no weapons of mass destruction. So the Bush administration had to come up with another justification for us being there. And one of the things they really clung to was this democracy dominoes theory. This theory that if you promoted democracy in Iraq, it would spread throughout the Middle East. Now, experts in the State Department told them that theory was not viable, it was not going to work, but the Bush administration clung to it anyway. So in around 2004, 2005, they started thinking, how can we get this vehicle to promote democracy through the Middle East, um, to really make it seem like we're interested in democracy? So they created the Foundation for the Future. Now, in the documents we looked at, it was first mentioned by Elizabeth Cheney, the daughter of Vice President Dick Cheney, in 2005. Well, what and, was she doing? At yeah, that at that time she was at the State Department. She was high up in the State Department. She was working on Middle East affairs. Um, and she first mentioned this foundation. So we think it might have been her idea or maybe the Vice President's idea and he channeled it through her. 
Um, and one of the first things she said about the foundation was that she wanted to bring in someone from the World Bank to work on it. Now this was sort of a weird thing to say because the World Bank is an international organization. It's not really connected with the State Department. There's no good reason to bring in a World Bank official to work on this project. And so who did they bring in to do this? They brought in Shaha Riza. And Shaha Riza. Riza, yes. Okay. And, and who is Sha that? She was the girlfriend of Paul Wolfowitz. And Paul Wolfowitz was, he's credited as the Iraq War architect. He was the second in command at the Defense Department. For those of you who have seen Fahrenheit 9-11, he was the guy who uh, had a comb and spit on it and then brushed his <laughs> hair. Um, and he went to work for the World Bank as president in 2005. He was appointed by? He was appointed, well, technically he was appointed by the Board of Governors, but the World Bank president in practice is pres uh, appointed by the U.S. president. But in theory, he's not really <coughs> supposed to be. Um, so he became the World Bank president, and Shaha Riza was working at the World Bank at the time as a communications officer. Uh, she was also a gender specialist and had expertise in the Middle East as well. Is she well. an American? She's not. She's a British national. Mm -hmm. um, so she was working at the State Department, and because of conflict of interest rules, she had to be moved. So rather than move her to a more independent branch of the World Bank or someplace else, they seconded her to the State Department, which was very unusual. I mean, she's not a U.S. citizen. It wasn't clear why they came up with this arrangement. Um, she was um, transferred to the State Department, where she worked in an unregulated, unsupervised position, possibly in violation of U.S. tax law, U.S. visa law. She didn't appear to have a national security clearance. Um, so it was, it was a little bit of a strange arrangement. And what was also strange is while she was in this position, she was making more money than Condoleezza Rice, Who the Secretary then? of State. So she's making much $7,000 a year more than the Secretary of you, State. You didn't happen to bring along a job application for this? So I <laughs> no, right I mean, I, I wish I had. That'd be a wonderful job. Because um, <laughs> it's not clear what she was doing. I mean, for all we know, she wasn't doing anything. Well, what kind of budget did this organization have pledged at the beginning? Sure. Um, and I should mention, actually, before we get into that, that how GAP got involved in this is Shaha Riza's payroll records were leaked to us in 2007. Um, and those records made it clear that she received a series of raises in violation of bank rules. So we verified that information, we disclosed it, and that eventually led to the resignation of Paul Wolfowitz as president of the World Bank. And there were a series of other scandals as well, but this is the one that really stuck. So we became interested in what is the foundation for the future? What is it doing? Why was Shahid Riza working at this nebulous organization? We filed a Freedom of Information Act request. It took more than a year and a half for us to get the first batch of documents. Um, by that point, people weren't really as interested in what this foundation was anymore. Um, so we got the documents, and one of the things we did look at was the budget. Um, well, that we wanted to look at was the budget. We didn't get the budget, mm -hmm. but we wanted to look at it. Um, Liz Cheney, when she first mentioned the foundation, said she wanted it to have a $60 million budget. Now, when she actually started lobbying governments, she wasn't able to get that. She, Condoleezza Rice, and also Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, and Shaha Riza um, lobbied to get foreign governments to support this because they wanted it to be a multilateral initiative. It was important that it wasn't just a Bush administration initiative because then it, it was would the clearly, coalition of the willing. Yeah, it, it was supposed to be a coalition of the willing, exactly. And if it was just the Bush administration, it really doesn't help this PR campaign very much. But when they went to foreign governments, foreign governments were not receptive to this idea. Unfortunately, we, GAP, don't know why, because when we got the documents, they were redacted when foreign governments expressed concerns. So it would say things like, the British government has misgivings about the foundation for the future, which include, and then there'd be a black marker, and you would have no idea what those misgivings were. But it was clear that um, foreign governments did not support the foundation, probably mainly because Liz Cheney was involved, so it's a little bit 
you know, hypocritical to have the daughter of the vice president coming and promoting a democracy organization when she herself is partly in her position, probably because of nepotism. So, so how big a budget? <laughs> how big a budget? Oh, I'm sorry. Decisions? Getting back to that question. Yeah. So <laughs> she wanted 60 million. Um, that didn't happen. So they went to the U.S. government, started lobbying the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Condoleezza Rice lobbied pretty heavily. Um, a board member, Sandra Day O'Connor, who was recruited by Condoleezza Rice. Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor. Yes, former justice. Um, she was former Supreme Court justice. She lobbied for this um, and successfully got the law changed three times to be more favorable to the foundation for the future. And ultimately, the U.S. Pax taxpayer dollars went to this foundation, 22 million of dollars of U.S. money went to this foundation. Out of now, how much, to how big a total budget? Sorry, I'm getting into that because um, it's a little more complicated than it seems. Um, so the 22 million was supposed to be matched as a condition of it being given, um, but and it, it was required by law to be matched in order for the U.S. to give it. So the State Department said that 22 million dollars had been committed by other governments. Turns out that wasn't true. Um, we can't tell from the documents if they were outright lying or if they something, you know, wires got crossed. But Ooh. they only only six million dollars came in from other foreign governments. So they said twenty two million was going to come in. We looked at the Foundation for the Future's financial records with the IRS, and only six million came in. So they had a budget of twenty eight million, almost eighty percent of which came from the U.S. government. So how easy was it for you to research this? This, this these were FOIAs and, and efforts that lasted almost three years. Yeah, well, I should say it was very difficult. I mean, originally we received more than 200 documents, so it was very time intensive to go through all those documents. But when we were looking through them, something that became really quickly apparent was that um, the juicy stuff, the numbers, the budget, the financial documents were all missing. So we're, we looked at it and we're like, where's the beef? Like all the good stuff has been hidden from us. And not only has it been hidden, but they haven't listed it as withheld. Because we knew that we weren't getting 50 documents. We knew that 80 documents were redacted. But we, the financial documents were not listed as withheld. So we went back to them and we said, clearly there are financial documents. They were required to be financial documents in this situation. We saw references to them. Why didn't we get them? We ended up going back and forth with the State Department on this for quite a while, which led to some of the delay. Um, and finally, we were able to get some of the documents, some of the financial reports. And what was really interesting to me was all these financial reports said is how much was spent in a certain amount of time. So it said uh, $200,000 was spent in this two months. But they didn't tell you what it was spent on, mm. which to us was not helpful at all. I mean, we still don't know what money went to Shah Hafiz's travel. I mean, we know her salary was paid by the World Bank, but we don't know what else this money really went to, especially in the early days when there wasn't much of a staff. Um, and, and they weren't making grants in the early days, but there was still quite a bit of money going to the foundation at that time. So it, it was difficult. It was very frustrating for us. Um, it was also frustrating other issues that we ran into with the FOIA process, including the overclassification of documents and the retroactive um, uh, classification right. of documents. Because right. we had, for example, a document that was titled Swiss Concerns About the Foundation for the Future. And that was retroactively classified, and it was also um, denied in full for national security reasons. And when you say retroactively and classified, you mean that it wasn't classified it, at it the time? It wasn't classified originally. And, and then we, they went back and did it yeah, after and they went, the fact. Yeah, they went back and did it after the fact. And it, it was very confusing to us what national security risk do, does a nonprofit, nonprofit foundation pose? You know, we couldn't understand. That's why it's a secret. You yeah, don't we, know. we couldn't <laughs> understand why it was a secret. And yeah, there's a legitimate reason that this foundation, which was presented to the outside world as a multilateral, open government democracy foundation, was so secretive. But I, I can't think of a good reason for that. Uh, Patrice, this was an overwhelmingly U.S. funded um, right. foundation. Of eight, almost 80% of the funding wow. came from the United States. So its records are supposed to be open, 
aren't they, under the Freedom of Information Act? I would think so, although, you know, there's also the example of the Smithsonian Institution, which is largely funded by the federal government with congressional, uh, congressionally appropriated money, but also gets money from other sources. And they've decided to voluntarily disclose some information, but they're not required to. So I would, it, we would actually need to see whether it c is considered an agency under the um, Freedom of Information Act and under the Administrative Procedures Act to, for, to know for certain if Whether they fully it's came, to, right, yeah. came under FOIA, yeah. But it isn't funding enough of a nexus to uh, subject No, one? apparently not. I mean, I would have said yes before we went through this thing a couple years ago with the Smithsonian Institution. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I think that that's not necessarily true. And um, again, it would have to go look at if they're defined as an agency. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's only on a voluntary basis. So. Well, you've been looking a lot at freedom of information under the Obama administration mm -hmm. as compared to the Bush right. administration. Right. We're, uh, we're now a few years uh, into right. the Obama administration. How is the administration doing on that front? I think it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and uh, a colleague organization crew has done a FOIA at midterm survey with the agencies. Um, I think their intent is good mm -hmm. and I think they are beginning to make very slow inroads, but I think... But wasn't there a presumption laid out at the right. very beginning of right. the administration that everything would be is, is unless open unless we clearly have a good reason right, not unless to. And we very, have to make right, a finding to that right, effect. Right, right. So what's and, happened with that? Well, I think what I was about to say was they have discovered, much to their surprise, that um, you could make declarations and it will affect some agencies and it will affect some sorts of releases, but it takes a very, very long time to turn around what was for eight years a um, a professional group, the FOIA officers, who were, you know, operating sometimes unwillingly, but operating under a non-disclosure uh, policy under you, the Freedom of Information Act. What do you mean a non-disclosure policy? Under the Ashcroft Memorandum, Ashcroft was the first Attorney General under uh, the Bush administration. What he, they essentially said, or what the Attorney General essentially said to the agencies was, if you can find any legitimate reason, any legal basis for withholding information, do it and we'll defend you in court. Now what Holder said, He's going, the new attorney general. The new attorney general, yes, um, Eric Holder, going more back to Janet Reno, who was attorney general under Clinton administration, said, unless you have a really clear understanding that there would be a harm to the country or a harm to the effective operation of the agency, um, you're supposed to disclose it. Now, there's some things that can be mandated that have to be withheld. Classified information is one. And I know from my past experience when I worked at the National Archives in the, what was the um, Carter Library at that point, that anything said by a foreign government is considered classified, unfortunately. So that's probably the. Yeah. Not very good, but the explanation for that. But so, yes, they, the rhetoric is wonderful. Um, the, in terms of actual litigation, my colleagues who do litigation tell me that they don't see much difference. Um, in terms of the you back. Mean people that are trying to get who access actually, yes. to government information and they sue the government. Sue the government, government. exactly. Yeah. So if, if GAP had gone to court. Which we did. Which we you did? Say. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wondered why you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Um, they're not seeing an enormous difference in the arguments that are being made by the administration. And we've tried to get the current Department of Justice to tell us what cases, what requests from the agencies to defend them in cases they've turned down. Mm -hmm. They won't tell us that. We think that would be a really good indicator of how serious they are about not defending agencies when they in, are improperly um, withholding information, but they won't, they won't tell us that. U.S. government's vast 
though, and some mm -hmm. agencies, are some agencies more forthcoming than Absolutely. other agencies? Absolutely. So talk about that. We have found, or my colleagues really have found over the years that some agencies have a culture that is about openness. Um, and other agencies, it's really not going to matter what the Attorney General says to them or what the President says to them. Their agency culture is, this information is my information and you can't have it. Interestingly, one of the best in terms of FOIA releases, not that people get everything, but is the Department of Defense. And um, I think that that's probably because they take orders. They understand that when they're, they have a clear policy to do something, they implement it. Mm -hmm. um, other agencies, and I'm not sure about State Department, I think they don't have a really good reputation in this area. Um, it varies, but, but it really is an agency culture. And I think that's part of what the administration has not understood, is that you really have to change the culture of government. And you can't change it just at the top. You, you can't have just your um, secretaries of agriculture or the secretary of state mouthing these words if they aren't really going to. Unless you have a strong chain of command exactly. structure. Right, really have to work to implement it. Rather than an ingrained bureaucracy where exactly. there are lots of turf, right. um, fe feudal fiefdoms, yes. as it were, yeah. within the Yeah, and agency. I'm sure that's part of the State Department. The other thing is, in fairness, a lot of the agencies don't have the resources that they need. Um, FOIA professionals, unlike a lot of other people in the government, don't have a career path. So it's very hard to get promotions in that field. You have to immediately go to being a manager, which some people don't want to do. And there's not a good reward incentives for releasing information. There are disincentives. I mean, the saying in Washington is you never want to release anything that's going to show up in the New York Times or the front page or the federal page, or we used to call it anyway, the federal page of the Washington Post. You can get in trouble for disclosing something. You don't generally get in trouble for withholding it. And, you know, even when they're taken to court, it's not the agency that bears that cost. The Department of uh, Justice is the ones that defend it, but it's us. It's we, the taxpayers, who pay to uh, defend the agencies in their withholding of information. So there's, there's no real cost to the agencies not to withhold it. And that's something that I think this administration is slowly and painfully uh, beginning to understand. There have been some reforms, though, to mm -hmm. FOIA, right? So, uh, and limiting of exemptions, like for security, SEC, right? Yes, yeah. And one of the areas, um, and that, that has not so much come from the administration, because actually it has been administration agencies that have been asking for what are called B3 exemptions to the FOIA. FOIA has nine exemptions. The third exemption is by other statute. And so you get language in, in other statutes that says, notwithstanding any provisions of the Freedom of Information Act, this information can be withheld. It can be withheld from the public, Congress, the courts, you know, they, they'll try everything. And, you know, there's always a plethora of those. And under the new uh, financial reform bill, the Dodd-Frank bill, the SEC tried to get language that would allow them to basically uh, withhold from the public information about their investigations and audits. And their argument, and it's the common agency argument, is that, well, you know, these regulated entities are not going to give us this information unless we know, they know that we'll protect it. SEC, for instance, has subpoena power. I mean, they can go get this information. But there is a, an agency um, attitude that they have to be collegial <laughs> with these entities, and we understand that when there's an ongoing investigation, certainly you don't release that information. Sure. But once the investigation is closed, one way or the other, or if they never do an investigation. Well, this is supposed to be public information, right? Right, right. And, and the public has a right to know if the, if the government what they're doing, or if they've chosen to do nothing, mm -hmm. which is 
unfortunately, over the last number of years, been much more common. So, and the reality is that the other, I mean, the other exemptions in the Freedom of Information Act, there's exemptions for law enforcement, there's information in ongoing investigations, there's an exemption before for uh, business, confidential business information. There's been no problem government-wide in protecting information about ongoing investigations. And what our community has argued is there's no reason to treat it differently agency by agency. The law works. It works really well. We have, you know, 40 years of litigation and court cases that, that make it clear where the rules are, what the rules are, where the boundaries are. So, um, well, let me ask you, because mm -hmm. we're running out of time, uh, uh, about some reform measures you would recommend. And, and I want to swing it back to what we were talking with Shelley right. Walden about. Um, doesn't it make sense that in a situation where the United States government, if it were conducting the activity directly mm -hmm. by it itself, would be subject to freedom of right. information if it creates, funds the creation of a, a nominally independent entity right. like the Foundation for the Future, shouldn't that entity also be subject to the Freedom of Information Act? I would say yes. But, uh, but again, it depends on, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, but I, I really do think it goes back to what the constitution, as it were, of that uh, entity is. Um, I would certainly argue that to the extent that it receives any taxpayer dollars, that the public has a right to know where that money is going and how it is being spent. And you know, that is a way in which this administration has really been trying to move government, and the Congress has too. In the last reform to the Freedom of Information Act, they made it very clear that it extends to contractors, for instance, so that agencies can't shift their records over to a contractor and then say, oh, you know, we, we don't have to comply with FOIA because they're over there and, and they're not subject to FOIA. So to the extent that maybe this entity, this foundation, Could were be a contractor, as right, a the contractor. contractor. Yeah. But certainly I do think that needs to be clarified. And like I said, I think the administration, you know, with the stuff, the Recovery Act money, they set up this whole system for tracking that all the way down to, you know, probably not the worker on the, manning the shovel. but. Um, to allow the public to know where their taxpayer dollars are going. And, and so I think that is a way that, in general, this administration, and in, way that in general, the government is going. I, I think, you know, it's the Googleization of government in some ways. The public expects to be able to look stuff up and to know what's going on. And why not? And why not, exactly. Well, many thanks to Patrice Thank McDermott of OpenTheGovernment.org and Shelley Walden of GAP for explaining FOIA and this mysterious organization. Right. <laughs> I'm Mark Cohen, and thanks for watching Whistle Where You Work.